Hello folks, welcome back to Lady Vinyl Gaming. Thank you for joining me on this Tuesday as we continue our Story Hour stream. Uh, for those of you who are new, Story Hour is where uh, we take a graphic novel game. No, not a graphic novel, a, a, a text-based game um, that has artwork, or I've commissioned artwork. Um, at this point, it's still uh, the game, uh, the game's artwork, um, and I read through the story. Um, so, yeah, uh, if you enjoy this, we do this every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern U.S. time. We also have a Sunday stream, which is um, the more traditional uh, me playing a, a more action-based game. Uh, with myself on the screen. Sometimes my friend Amanda Paskey joins me as well. Uh, we're playing on there. Uh, we tried Stray last week. Um, not sure if I'm going to continue that or not. Uh, we are doing, if Amanda shows up, we are going to do uh, Lego's DC Super Villains. Um, and I am also on my own doing uh, Dragon Age. So uh, we'll see. It's, it'll be one of those three games on the Sundays. You can also, uh, if you enjoy the gaming content, go to OnlyFans, where I do uh, videos. They don't let me stream directly yet. Um, do videos of playing a, a game called No Place Like Home, just with a little less clothing. Um, so if you like looking at lesbians or you like video games, either way, uh, go on to... Only fans and subscribe to me there. Uh, the subscriptions are free there. Um, it is not not something you have to pay for, so you can still uh, go there and enjoy it. So, last time we were doing uh, Werewolf the Apocalypse: Heart of the Forest, we uh, had attend. Uh, we had gone into the forest uh, and discovered that it kind of has its own soul. Um, and then had attended a protest uh, against a uh, government-backed uh, logging company that's tearing down some of the old forest. Um, and that, that got a little interesting. So uh, let me do a little fixing of the audio because I'm coming out. There we go. Is that better? That's, that's a little bit better. I'm going to set myself there so I don't blow up the audio. And we're going to take it from there. Uh, I am going to warn you, even though I do different voices for the different characters, I very rarely remember what each character's voice is, so don't be surprised if they change. Uh, they change from the previous stream. So, yeah. Oh, speaking of which, hey, Tally, evening to you as well. Um, if you do... Uh, miss a section or uh, if you prefer you're more than welcome to check out the YouTube channel and uh, watch the previous uh, editions uh, the Sunday stream usually goes up on the following Monday the Tuesday story hour goes up at some point I try to do it before the next week but it's not always perfect so here we go chapter three standoff I need to talk. I thought about going back to sleep, but I couldn't. Since I'd arrived in this village, I felt like I was falling down a rabbit hole, or rather, a wolf's den. My dreams were getting more and more vivid, and I was scared. I needed to talk it over with someone I trust. I'd come here with Anya, and despite all the strange things I've done, she's still stuck with me. A uh, Uber is pulling in now. <laughs> yes, Brett. Thanks for joining me. Uh, glad the uh, Uber uh, got you here. Uh, I'd come here with Anya, and despite all the strange things I'd done, she still stuck with me. I messaged her, and she messaged me back. I'm on a walk. Come join me. The sun had just set, and the moon wasn't up yet. The forest loomed on the horizon. The activist camp was somewhere there. We met near the shop in Balawaski. It was a characteristic enough point and easy to get to from anywhere in town. What is it? 
Anya asked. She looked worried. I... Don't, don't you think there's something really strange happening here with all the people in the forest? I'm, I'm scared, Anya. There is something strange happening, she nodded. But I have no idea what it is. I know even less than you. She frowned. Maybe we should go to your new friends. The activists? They, she smiled a little. They are weird. They must know something. Mm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um. I smiled. That's why I came to you. You have the best ideas. She smiled and started walking. Let's go. I'm sure they're not sleeping. Do you mind if I text Bardic? I promised I'd meet him tonight. I didn't mind. And he soon joined us. And he soon joined us. The camp had a different vibe than a logging site protest. There were more people there. We looked around, trying to take it all in. The people in the camp seemed quite cheerful. I saw people at work. Some of them were filling big barrels with sand. Some were busy making what seemed to be posters. The rest were singing or cooking. Everyone was contributing in one way or another. I have no idea what your plan is, said Bardic, but you have my full support. I have no idea why I made him some weird Irish-Scottish accent. I'm, I'm not great at this. I'm just trying to give different voices so you know somebody else is talking. Uh. Hello, I said as I approached. Cornell smiled at me. Hello, he said. What brings you here? I'm confused, I answered. Is it really true? I mean, all the stories I've heard connecting me and the forest? Cornell looked at me with uncanny, with those uncanny gray eyes. I could feel his attention locked on me. Yes, it's true, he said. And that's why we're here, to stop the government destroying the forest, to show that we don't agree and that we hope to make a difference, and you have your role to play. Will it work? I asked. I don't know. All I know is that it worked before. It worked for Gandhi. It worked with segregation and apartheid in the end. It worked with communism. So let's see if it works with capitalism as well. Violence is not an option here. He smiled. And I think you know quite well. The anger doesn't really get shit done. I smiled back. Somehow being around him made me feel more relaxed. I know. You can count on me, I answered. The forest needed my help, and I couldn't be just an observer anymore. So we may so we may have a little citizen protest going on tonight, Cornell said, but I'll need your support if we want to convince the others. They all wanted to do something that night. But after a whole day's discussion, they were still divided on what to do. Three for one option, three for another. I saw no reason to back up Olga. I don't know why it's saying that, because it's not really a choice. I don't, I don't know what Olga's thing is. All right. A little help from my friends. I voted for the peaceful protest. And soon, we were on our way to the National Park Headquarters and Education Center. We had some banners to install. Bardic hesitated for a long time, but he joined us in the end. I'm only coming because my dad is out tonight and he won't see me coming in late, he mumbled. This is so exciting, 
Anya whispered. I've never done anything so illegal. Some choice options won't be available if your rage is too low. Okay, that's fair. And that's good to know. So thank you, Brad. Soon we were there. We were on our way. I realized that we followed the path only because of my vote. I made a difference. The, nat <coughs> the National Park headquarters were located in something called Palace Park. The name was historical. The name, like everything in Poland, was historical. Of course, now that I'm reading the freaking parts, now it's going to throw it into the actual text of the story. I just can't win. The name, like everything in Poland, was historical. Centuries ago, some king had his hunting lodge there, but now it was a mismatch of old and new, scatter new buildings scattered around the park. Some were rough and bulky, made of stone and brick, while others were an extravaganza of wooden porches, lace-like shutters, and meticulously sculpted pillars. There was no one around, but the area was well lit. This wasn't your everyday act of vandalism. This was something bigger. More important, yes but also more dangerous. Getting arrested in Poland didn't seem like a great way to start my visit. In fact, it could be the end to it. Suddenly, I remember the church located just next to the palace gate. I could feel his dark silhouette looming in the darkness, waiting. They'd spent the whole day painting the sign on a length of material sewn together from what looked like old sheets that were various shades of gray-white. The dark green letters declared, Wood is the enemy of the forest. Wood is the enemy of the forest? The forest is made of wood. I don't, I don't, I, I, Fred, Tally, if somebody there listening has an idea how in the world that wood is the enemy of the forest... I don't, I'm, I'm a little confused. Anyways, where do we hang it? Asked Daniel, who'd come equipped with climbing gear. I think we should attach it to the drain pipes there and there. I pointed at two corners of the building and Daniel grunted in agreement. It doesn't matter, she said, because hanging the banner is a waste of time. I looked at her, curious what kind of advice she could offer us. So what could we do better the next time? I asked her for advice. We could vote for a plan that is a chance to actually help the forest. Olga rolled her eyes. Probably a bad translation in English. Yeah, that's fair. Uh... It's a great banner, and I'm sure it'd look good on the pictures published by a number of independent political blogs. She looked at Cornell. I'm not even sure which one's talking. But it's stuck so deep into the overeducated ecological dispute that people won't get it, and the loggers won't care. Cornell just shook his head and gestured Daniel to continue. Soon the sign was up, screaming our message to all of Balawazia. Cornell looked at me. Mia, what do you think? I don't get that slogan, or I said that it was glorious. I definitely don't get that slogan. I don't even get that slogan, I admitted. Cornell looked surprised. Nobody told you? It's from a famous book about the Puzawaska. Humans let the forest grow so they could take wood from it. But that isn't the purpose of the forest, and when done on a huge scale, it's actually devastating. Finally, we pulled the banner up. My father will have a stroke when he sees this, Bardic let out a repressed laugh. It's an important message, Anya looked up with fire in her eyes. The world must know. I looked at the sign, flying high over the park. When we finished, 
Cornell gathered us together. I was proud of what we'd, con what we'd accomplished, and I contributed to that. We helped the forest, even if it was only a little. Cornell reached for his bicycle. Let's go for a trip, he said, to remind ourselves what we're trying to protect. Gunshots in the woods. The woods were full of stars. We cycled in silence, enjoying the company of the forest as it enjoyed ours. After some time, the place of power opened up before us. The boulders looked relaxed. A soft breeze rustled in the trees, welcoming us. We should have stayed home, whispered Bardic, and the whisper carried in the air. This is not a good night to be out here. His nervousness was getting to me. The energy was still there. I knew it, but it couldn't reach me. Not if I didn't allow it to. I wondered if anybody else felt it at all. Do you guys feel that? I looked at my companions. But before anyone could answer, a loud sound tore through the silence. It was a gunshot. Anya gasped, looking around wide-eyed and terrified. The others tensed up, but they didn't look concerned, just confused. We have to get out of here, immediately! Bardic's whisper was frantic and scared. There's a hunting party out here! Cornell turned toward us like he'd finally put something together. There was a rustle, and I saw a bunch of men in camo, each of them with a rifle, coming toward us between the trees. I watched their angry steps and listened to the murmured curses. Something was strangely familiar. The men at the front looked exactly like an older version of Bardic. He weighed us up for a moment, then focused on Cornell. The sir is closed for the night, the huntsman said in Polish. There was contempt in his voice. There is a hunt going on and y'all are trespassing. We have police officers here, so I would go home if I were you. Unless you want to get arrested. I felt the forest tense up. The man was the one who was trespassing. This man, I realized, was no one. He wasn't important here. What was important was the forest and what it needed. And it cared about me and didn't want me to get hurt. There would be other nights and other people to fight, but right then I felt that it wanted me to leave. Into the night. I ran, the air in my lungs boiling, my skin slick with sweat, and the darkness thick around me. Anya and Bardic were running just behind me, or so I hoped. We left the shouts and gunshots long behind us, but we couldn't stop. Something was chasing us. Two silhouettes, one lean, the other bulky. I saw them in the corner of my eye as they leapt forward. At first, I thought they were people, but as they leapt, they got longer. Longer, smaller, I, I couldn't see clearly. It was dark, sweat was blinding me, and they were hiding behind the trees. I heard howling and growling, and then I saw there were wolves chasing us. I heard them snarling and snapping one after the other. I stopped in the middle of the path and turned to face the animals. I couldn't explain why, but I knew it was the right thing to do. What are you doing? whispered Anya, terrified. Bardic grabbed her wrist and pulled her off the path. I looked at the wolves. They looked at me. You're looking for me? I asked, hoping that my nonchalance would confuse them. The wolves dispersed, and then something happened. Something I couldn't see clearly. 
and two people stepped out of the bushes. They looked at each other with murder in their eyes. Insolent as always, Olga growled and lunged at me. I closed my eyes. There were a series of wet cracks like skin breaking, torn from within my muscles that suddenly grew by bones rapidly getting longer, by fur and teeth and claws. When I dared to look, I saw two eight feet tall monsters standing in front of me on the narrow path in the forest. Everything finally clicked. I fucking knew it! And then one of the monsters clawed at the other, lunged and closed its jaws on the other's throat. Blood splattered, drenched me, and before I could start streaming, it was all over. I saw life leave the strange gray eyes. The surviving monster listed, lifted its black and white muzzle. It reeked of death, and its teeth were dripping blood, and jumped at me. And then, there was only pain. The pain was unbearable. Nothing in my life prepared me for this. Blinded by the blood in my eyes and the searing pain in my shoulder and chest, I could only laugh. This wasn't what I'd expected from this trip. You spend so much time planning, only to see your whole life crash and burn. All I could do was laugh. but I knew how serious this was. So I laughed, grinning with bloody teeth until my strength left me and I couldn't hold myself upright anymore. The forest caught my fall with a bed of moss and twigs. I stopped thrashing and a cold numbness engulfed me. I punched the earth, trying to get some feeling in my hands. I gritted my teeth and tried to get up and I collapsed again. I felt so cold. Suddenly, there was light. I looked up. The full moon. It looked different. Your willpower dropped to zero. When you lose all your health or willpower, you become impaired. This will make physical tasks. If you have zero health or social menial task, if you have zero willpower, harder and sometimes impossible. The moon was a goddess, and she noticed me. Get up, she said. I got up. I get up. I feel good. I know that I shouldn't, but I don't remember why. I don't care. My mind is clearer than it's ever been before. I see the world in sharp contrasts of black and white, movement and stillness. I smell prey. I hear language in the howdy. I hear language in the hooting of owls, the whistling of the wind, and the snarling of wolves. I am one with the forest. My muscles are sore and cramped. So I stretch like I've never stretched before. My arms are longer. My legs are stronger. My heart is pumping and I feel like I've been sp and I feel like I've spent my whole life packed into a box and I have finally been set free. I take a breath and feel my ribs and muscles move. The forest smell of blood and fear and excitement. I laugh happily, and others' laughter joins me. We laugh and sing to the moon. Something stings me. I look around. There's a small malformed creature pointing a stick at me. So the stick blazes with fire, and there's another sting. The creature is no threat to me, but its presence is annoying. Its smell almost sends me reeling and I don't like being pricked. I 
I push the creature away, and it flies through the air, making funny noises. Then it hits a tree and stays there, pinned to a branch like a butterfly. My ears prick, and I hear more creatures running blindly through the bushes. My leg no longer stings, and I feel better than ever before. I smell prey, and I start hunting. They do not see me as I move silently through the undergrowth. The creatures are running away, their backs turned to me. I watch them and learn how they move. Suddenly, one of them turns my way. We lock glances. I roar, and the creature falls down and curls into a ball. It smells of ammonia. Piercing light burns my eyes. The creatures surround me. They seem to work like a pack. They are dangerous. I hide in the shadows, and they are too slow, too dumb, too clueless to notice me. I strike them down, one by one. Some manage to defend themselves briefly, but most of them don't see me coming. The wind brings a new smell. The air tastes of fur and musk and blood. Shapes move among the trees, but they are no creatures. They are people like me. Suddenly, I'm surrounded by them. I think I know them. They seem familiar. It's like I met them in the past, but they were hidden. They close in on me. What do they want? I relax and wait for them unflinching. They approach me and sniff the air. Their smells are overwhelmingly familiar. Once the people had sounds attached to them, but now I realize the sounds were not their true names. I look up and see no moon, only clouds and tangled branches. Something changed, and I realized how tired I was. I stumbled. Darkness. Nothing was okay. The night sky was full of stars. Confused, I opened my eyes. The forest around me was thick and dark. The tree trunks, wrapped tightly in dark-leaved ivy, were covered in ripples of lichen when the where the vines hadn't taken hold. The thorny, leafless bushes at their base were overrun with nettles. The fungi radiated with a ghoulish, sickly green light. Dark, sponge-like mushrooms clung to the fallen trees. I took a deep breath and winced. There was a foul smell in the air. Suddenly I realized it wasn't the forest that smelled so foul. It was me. I looked down and saw my hands covered in a dark substance. I was naked. A sticky, glistening film of liquid was clinging to my skin. I could feel it on my face, my hair, blood. There was a whisper. The word resonated in my head. Garu. I knew what was coming. I remembered my dream and slowly lifted my eyes. I saw a mutilated body. Its severed head was right in front of me. Overcoming my disgust, I gently touched its wet hair and watched as the head toppled over. The face was contorted, the eyes bulging, the mouth open as though the head was still struggling for air. Oh my god, I recognized that face. It was Cornell, his green, piercing eyes now dull and dead. The head watched me with reproach. I felt tears running down my cheeks, and I let the sadness in. 
The bushes rustled, and a moment later I saw Olga. She came out from between the trees, wiping something red off her hands. She looked at me, at the head, at my face. Get used to it, she said. You're a werewolf. I looked at her. I blinked. Everything faded to black. Chapter 4 Lost in the Woods <laughs> The Heart of the Forest The morning smelled of safety, fur, earth, and the forest. I opened my eyes and saw other people cuddling up to me, their muzzles resting on their paws as they slept. Gentle snoring filled the warm space under the low-hanging branches of an old spruce tree. Quietly, so as not to wake anyone, I crawled outside. Alone, hiding in the tall grass. <laughs> Let's try that again. Alone, hiding in the tall grass, I sniffed around. The sky was bright, and the forest around me was dark and full of interesting smells. High in the trees, birds yelled about status, sex, and violence. I was in danger. The thought was abrupt and unwelcomed, but like a siren. Something had happened last night. I pressed myself flat to the ground and pricked my ears. They wouldn't find me unprepared. A creature stirred in bushes nearby, a tall, dark silhouette, a strangely familiar smell. I tense up and watch the human as they looked around. Maya, there you are, they said as they noticed me. It was time to get out of there. I spasmed. Suddenly, a feeling like cramp or a spasm surged through me and everything changed. My body started resetting itself to the familiar shape, and it hurt. Bones broke and fused again. Muscles and sinews moved under my skin. I cried and thrashed. Then, panting and sweaty, I was humid again. I hit the ground with my bare ass. Colors exploded, the morning breeze suddenly became cold, and I shivered. I looked up. Confused, I looked at the person approaching me. Get dressed, Olga threw me a bundle of clothes. And stay human, they won't survive the change. Not until Lisa deems that you're worthy to learn the right, at least. We looked at each other. As for what you saw yesterday, she added quietly, it had to be done. I snatched the bundle and started pulling the clothes on. Sturdy but comfortable boots, cargo pants, a green hoodie, they fit perfectly. I thought about the previous night when I was raging through the forest about how differently I experienced the world through the wolf senses and about the discomfort and confusion of changing shape. There was no denying it. I was no longer human. Did you mention a right? I raised an eyebrow. I raised an eyebrow. You mean magic is real? You're a werewolf. Do you even need to ask? We just stood there for a moment, comfortable in silence. I was wondering how one usually learned that they were a werewolf. So how did you become, how did you, you know? What a brilliant conversationalist I was. A werewolf? No, oh, well, Olga ran her hand through her hair. I was born here, you know. I always knew I was different. 
I nodded and gave her the space to talk. And being a lesbian in such a small community in the early 90s was a problem. She shook her head and continued. So I went to study in Warsaw and for a moment everything was fine. I met this really nice girl. I can only imagine how great it must have felt. I can only imagine how great it must have felt like. I smiled. Olga was silent for a moment, lost in her memories. Then she continued. We were partying one night and three dudes attacked us. When I came around, they were lying on the ground with their guts ripped out. My girlfriend was nowhere to be seen. And then what? I was curious what happened next. Frankly, it's none of your business, Olga bristled. I've already told you more than I wanted. It doesn't make any sense, it suddenly struck me. How come nobody knows werewolves exist? We protect the veil, was the answer. It's easy to convince humans the supernatural doesn't exist. They already want to believe that, and the delirium helps. You mean delirium is in the medical condition? I asked, remembering something that I'd read about acute confusional states. You'll have to ask Pat for that, but the gist of it is that humans are incapable of remembering what they s that they saw Krynos. She laughed. They panic, turn away, and instantly forget. Every time. Then I realized something important. At some point, the rest of the party had awoken and joined us. The clearing was full of wolves. Fuck. The wolves were closing in on me. But they weren't really wolves, were they? They were werewolves, like me. Oh, yeah. We're, we're accepting this. It's the, for me, it's the whole point of the game. Do have impaired wolf power, though. I need to remember that. Hiding the bodies. The headless body was heavy. They said that as my first kill, it was my board. They said that as my first kill, it was my burden. It was my duty to take it to the burrows. I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to do this, I said as it slipped from my hands again. We're a guru, and when we rage, people die. Olga stood by my side. He had it coming. She accompanied me, carrying the severed head in a bag. The other stayed behind, covering the tracks. I didn't want to talk, or to think for that matter. Not about the person I was carrying, or rather trying to carry. It was just a thing. I needed to transport it. I needed to transport it from point A to point B. That was it. I have no willpower. I kept dragging the body, but the burden was too much to bear. I was tired and hurt, and I just couldn't do it anymore. I looked at the body, and I wanted, really wanted to say something, but I choked on my words. I curled up into a ball with my arms around my head. I can't, I said, and then it was the only thing I could say, louder and louder, until it became a shriek. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't! Olga sighed and kneeled beside me. You're a werewolf. Gaia's soldier. There's nothing, nothing you can't do. Get up. We have a world to save, and you have an obligation to this forest. I took a deep breath. She was right. I was here for a reason, and I had things to do. Oh.
Now we're going to choose your form. Galp Rose is strong enough to lift heavy things without breaking a sweat and intimidate. Kronos is a war form, a ruthless killing machine. There's nothing subtle about it. Hispo is a monstrous wolf, smart, fast, heavy, and absolutely scary. And Lupus is the regular wolf form, a majestic animal with all of its advantages and limitation. Looks great on camera. All right, let's do this. I was Glassbro, the near human form. The pain was stronger than I ever imagined. I felt my muscles spasm as they rearranged themselves. My jaw cracked and my mouth filled with blood. I clenched my fists and claws drove into my palms. I screamed. When I rose, panting and sweating, I was more than human. I was glass bro, wolfish, strong, scary. The change hurt more than I expected. The world shifted, not much, but enough. I felt my teeth get sharper and muscles get stronger. I picked up the body. It was a lot lighter. At some point, I realized we weren't alone. There were two shapes in the bushes on either side of the road. Animals. One big and gray, the other small, nimble and white. Ah, my companion smiled. I see you've noticed our patrons. Yeah, we know each other, I said, remembering my dream. We sort of met the other night. The two wolves stopped in front of me in the middle of the path. We came here to teach the cub, said the wolf. She smelled of ash and tears. I couldn't believe what I saw. It made no sense. I felt as if my brain was short-circuiting, trying to interpret singles, signals. I felt as if my brain was short-circuiting, trying to interpret signals not meant for human senses. My eyes told me there was a wolf staring at me, but when I looked at it, I felt ash on my tongue. I heard a morning howl so deep it reverberated in my bones, and I smelled fire. And when it talked, it was like the rustling of leaves formed words in my brain. But hallucinations or not, they just wouldn't leave me alone. The weasel circled me, and before I knew it, I could feel small claws on my leg, and on my back, and then on my arm. It smelled of musk and electricity, and then it bit my ear. Get off me, I yelled, trying to knock the weasel off my arm. Ooh, a feisty one. I like it. Its electronic voice echoed in my head. Enough, the wolf growled. Or at least, that's what my brain decided to hear. I felt the weasel draw its bath. In the beginning, there was Gaia, a.k.a. Mother Earth. And she gave birth to a mighty breed of warriors, the weasel began. It sounded electronical, like a teenage reading a Wikipedia page over a voice chat. They were called Garu, that's werewolves in werewolfish. And their sole purpose was to protect Gaia. They failed, wailed the wolf. There was danger everywhere, shrugged the wolf when I looked to her for advice. When time began, Gaia released three primal forces upon the earth. The weaver, the wild, and the worm, the weasel continued. The wild was the untamed force of life and creation. The cold, ruthless weaver gave structure to the world, and the worm destroyed what needed to be destroyed creating balance.
So were werewolves creatures of the worm? I asked. Destroying imbalance? They were Gaia's children, the wolf snarled. Born to herd and contain humans. I can see that something went wrong, I smiled wryly. The weaver grew too ambitious and trapped the worm within its life lifeless web, the weasel answered. Confined and denied, the worm went slowly insane. Now Gaia is dying, choked by the weaver and eaten alive by the worm, wailed the wolf. And you cannot reason with the worm, she snarled. You can only fight it. Then it turned and led the way. The barrows look just like I remember them, but somehow calmer, warm, and welcoming. Olga, neared, Olga kneeled near one of the womb. Olga kneeled near one of the bounds, put her hand on it, and whispered a few words. I saw the ground open slowly, like a mouth in the earth. I sighed. <sighs> Let's do this. We took the severed head and the body I had wrapped up in sheets and put them in the hole. It closed slowly, and I could swear I heard the trees and I could swear I heard the trees nearby sigh in anticipation. The wolf howled, and I could feel the hair on my hands rise. Welcome to your new life, the talking white weasel grinned. We have something else to show you. Vision Quest you're a cub, so you have special privileges, said the weasel. Puchka will grant you a vision. You must see to understand, said the wolf. Think carefully before you choose what to see. Oh. Um. I'm I'm actually going to call it there. Uh, we are 61% of the way through this. I am not exactly sure which vision I want to have yet. So we're going to actually uh, leave it at, at that. Um, so yeah. I hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be back next week uh, at our regular time, 5 p.m. Eastern U.S. time, for more Story Hour. Thank you, and have a good night.